Gracious Father, we are grateful to you for the privilege to be alive, for the privilege to witness today. Thank you for what you are doing in our lives. Lord, today we submit our lives to you to continue that which you have begun. We ask that in mercy you will be gracious to us. You will release your word unto our lives to the intent, O oh God, that our lives will be conformed to the image of Christ, that our life will produce fruit that will bring glory to your name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So the last time we were concluding about the issue of worldliness, um, we looked at uh, James chapter 4, verse 4. I think that was where we ended the last time, James chapter 4 and verse 4. All right. Uh, so we will just pick it up from there. Our conclusion was that uh, friendship with the world is enmity with God. And nobody wants to make God his or our enemy. Okay? Now, you see, the opposite of worldliness is holiness. The opposite of righteousness is wickedness. So if you are not righteous, you are wicked. If you are not holy, you are worldly. And there is no third position. You are either one of these two. God doesn't define wickedness the way we look at wickedness. We look at wickedness from the point of a man inflicting harm on another person. But as far as God is concerned, if you are not righteous, you are wicked. And righteousness today comes only from Jesus Christ. Now, holiness means that you are separated unto God. Now, if you are not separated unto God, you are worldly. It's as simple as that. You are worldly. So in verse 5, he says, Do you think that the scripture said in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us, lusted to envy? You get what this scripture is saying. To understand what this verse 5 is saying, we need to go to verse 4. We need to go to verse 4. It says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of this world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Can you see? If I ask you today, who is the enemy of God? You say Satan. <laughs> you will say Satan. But do you know that? Whoever therefore will be friend of the world is enemy of God. So when God is counting his enemy, he will count such persons as part of his enemy. Anybody that will be friendship with this world. So it's a very serious matter. Worldliness is a very serious matter. And that's why it must be well understood that worldliness is not um issue of buying car issue of buying houses or no 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 you see worldliness is simply you not holy if you are not holy you are worldly to be holy means that you've been set aside for god only god has the exclusive right as to what you do with your life you are not conformed to this world you are conformed to christ so it's a serious matter that our action can make us to become an enemy of God. So just imagine what is happening today. The level of worldliness, even in the church. And then we are crying to God to kill our enemies. <laughs> the prayer is not only unscriptural, it is even foolishness. Because if God will grant that prayer, many Christians will drop dead instantly. And they'll be like, why are we dead? Because you are an enemy of God. Friendship with this world. He who is a friend of this world is an enemy of God. Now, so now understand verse 5. And I say, do you think that the scripture said in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lost it to heaven? He's saying that, do you think that, don't you understand it, that the scripture has said that there's a spirit that is within us. And that is the Holy Spirit. And that spirit is 
is a spirit that is against the spirit of this world. So when you, when you bring upon worldliness into it, you make the spirit in you uneasy. That's what this scripture is saying. You make the spirit of God in you to become uneasy by becoming worldly, by becoming a friend of this world. You make the spirit of God uh, to, to, to lost to envy. Now, verse 6 now says, but, 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 he gave it more grace. He gave it more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resisted the proud, but gave it grace to the humble. So, in other words, what God has done is to give us the grace not to be worldly. He gives us grace. Not to be worldly, all right. Now, but it didn't stop at that. He now said, We are for God resisted the proud, but give red grace unto the humble. You know that you see, being proud, being proud is a serious problem. I want you to note one thing in verse 4, it says, Whoever therefore will be friend of this world. Is, as, is an enemy of God. So you see that worldliness, it doesn't matter what people say about you. It is the real problem of worldliness is that you make yourself an enemy of God. That's one. In verse 6, it says, God resisted the proud and gave grace to the humble. So what's the next thing you see again? It is God that is against the person that is proud. So you see, if you, you, you have enough motivation to cry to God that, Lord, you must deal with pride in my heart. You must deal with pride because pride is what makes God to be against you. In fact, other versions is God opposes the proud. In other words, you make God your opponent. God becomes a stumbling block to a proud person. So, you see, it's not about people's opinion about you. This thing is personal. Do you want God to resist you? Do you want God to be against you? Do you want God to oppose you? Do you want to be an enemy of God? We have seen the danger of worldliness. That the danger is that it makes you an enemy of God. We are now seeing the danger of pride. It makes you also an enemy of God. God will be the one opposing you. So what you should care about is not people saying that you are proud. That's not the issue. The opinion of men about pride does not matter. In fact, in most cases, their opinion is not accurate. Because men don't understand what pride is. This scripture gives us an understanding of what pride is. Verse 7. But the, the, before I go to that verse 7, I want you to see that whereas God opposes the proud, he didn't just, he will not just not oppose the humble. He gives something to the humble. So again, you see two positions here. You are either proud or you are humble. If you are proud, you will experience roadblock. You will experience the resistance of God. Can you imagine that you are going from pillar to post? You are going from one prayer meeting to another. Seeking solution. Yet, the person that is opposing you is God. And you have never realized that you have become an opposition to God. <laughs> you see, if people will sit down sometimes and reflect and listen to the word of God, they will realize that many of the prayers they are praying, they are not necessary. If God resists the proud, brethren, 
ensure that there is no iota of pride in you in any form and you will soon see what pride is but the good part is that he gives grace also to the humble so who is a humble person and who is a proud person i spoke with a woman who um she's been having issues in her marriage but then she has fasted <laughs> the way some people are fasting i've had to tell many people please stop fasting what are you fasting for she has fasted she has gone to mountain the latest one was that she told me she said she has joined a prayer meeting they hold every morning i'm sure you know that prayer meeting she said she has joined that prayer meeting and i told her i said if you are in that prayer meeting for the next 50 years your problem will not be solved nothing will work in your life i said you are not going to hear the truth there i said this prayer meeting they are not interested in your life being right with god what they are telling you is that they can solve all your problems no matter how you are living even if you are living in sin it is no problem just come we will solve all your problem our god can do anything that's the impression they give to you i said and that is why a lot of people go there people are looking for solution they are not looking for a savior so we got engaged further only to realize that she actually married in disobedience she she went and married another woman's husband <laughs> she went and married another woman's husband and thought that she could settle and that was her own first husband and thought that she could settle down begin to have their children and everything will be fine and initially it started like that the man became exceedingly rich to the point where they were going to uk australia dubai just for holiday extremely rich but then <laughs> everything started crumbling and then now the, the marriage is at the point of divorce so eventually, you know, because she, as usual, she said so many things about how wicked this man had been. And truly the man has been wicked. But eventually, it came out as say, you went to marry another woman's husband. What were you expecting? That sin that you thought it was, oh, it, you had covered it, you had perfected it. That's what is haunting you. Now you are running to prayer meetings where nobody will take time to teach you the word of God. All they are going to tell you is that they will ask you to write your prayer request. They will add it to the numerous requests. And then they will be doing magic and lay hands on it and give you the impression as if they are the one that commands God in heaven to answer prayers. What am I saying? If you make yourself an opponent of God, you are wasting your time praying. And that's the problem. Many people are running from here to there to there to there. If they only sat down and allowed the word of God to dissect their lives, they will realize they don't need prayer. <laughs> they don't need to run in here and there. Sometimes what some situation needs, it's just honest repentance. Just honest repentance. You know, sadly, last week, we had the story of um, this so-called pastor. He started church with his friend. He said the church was not growing. So they went to consult some occult people or herbalist or something. Anyway, to cut the long story short, he killed his friend that they started the church with and used part of his body 
planted it in different parts of the church building. <laughs> True life story. True life story. Now the church has three branches. As at the time he was caught, as at the time the secret got leaked, the church has three branches. Those are the church you will be running to and they will be telling you in this church things are happening. It is not in Christ that things are happening. It is in church things are happening. Anywhere you are going to that they are telling you with this man, your prayer will be answered. I'm telling you, Jesus is not there. Jesus did not give the key to our prayer being answered to any man on earth. So if anybody gives you the impression that, oh, oh, your prayer will be answered when you come here, it is a lie. You have made yourself an enemy of God. You need to settle those kind of issues. <laughs> Many people are in church today. They are God's enemy. They are worldly and they are proud. And I will show you now. So let's look at what it means to be proud. And when you understand that, you understand what it means to be humble. Verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore. Now, that word therefore connects back us to verse 6. In verse 6, we are told that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So he now wants to help you to be on the humble side. So how will you be humble? He says, submit yourself therefore to God. Humility is submission to God. Pride is disobedience to God. Let me make it simpler. Humility is obedience to the word of God. Pride is disobedience to the word of God. It's as simple as that. Disobedience to the word of God. It says, submit yourself therefore to God. People are hearing the word of God. Every day. They go back and do what they like. We are wasting our time praying. There is just too much prayer going on in the church. But those prayers, they do not go beyond the roof of our buildings. Because there are prayers on the lips of men and women that are proud. You know it is pride that as a man you are hearing God's word. He is saying to you, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. You will still turn again and still do your own way. Can I tell you you are wasting your time praying. You are simply wasting your time doing. In fact, there is no point for you saying you are going to church. You are just, you are basically just wasting your life. Because God will resist you. You think that a proud person is somebody that comes like this. Ah, you say this person is proud. Look at the way he's walking. <laughs> you person may be proud but you see the first issue about pride is that you are not submissive to God you are not submissive to the word of God I'm telling you you are wasting your time praying all manner of prayers whereas all that you need is just obedience. A man told me, he said, sir, I regret marrying my wife. I don't like my wife. Ha! I am like, this woman, you saw her on your own. She was just doing her own thing. You saw her. You are the one that went to her. You told her you like her. 
You told her you want to marry her. She did not come to you to say, come and marry me. You are the one that carried your two legs and say, I want to marry you. And then you married this woman. Now you have turned to a monster. He said, I regret marrying her. You regret bone of your bone. You regret flesh of your flesh. I said the scripture says, husband, love your wife. And so, and I'm like, see, look at it, please. Look at it, look at it, look at it. He's seeing it, he's looking at it. Yes, sir, I agree. I agree. But not my own wife. I'm like, how can you read the scripture and your heart is still so hardened? And you will still say that, no, 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 no. I, I don't want to have anything to do with that woman. I said, then what do you want to do? You can't, you are not even afraid that your life is in opposition to God. You are not, you are not fearful. You don't tremble. That's why the Bible says God will look at him who trembles at his word. Many people today do not tremble at the word of God. They only know how to post the word of God. They don't know how to tremble at the word of God. I said, don't you know that you will regret what you are doing? Don't you know you can never amount to anything with what you are doing? He said, love your wife as Christ loved the church. You are reading me. I said, please, brother. Oh, yeah. Read, read, read Ephesians 4.25 yourself. He said, you can read it. Okay, what has this woman done to you? What exactly is the problem? Is she committing adultery? He said, no. I said, brother. You are the one that has problem. No matter what you think this woman is doing, you are the one who has problem. Because you, you are not committed to obey God's word. So I don't need to even know what she's doing. The fact that you can't obey God's words shows that something is wrong. You that you should be crying and say, Lord, help me to love my wife. No matter what happens, Lord, help me to love her. Help me to reveal Jesus to my wife. I said, that's the word. I said, that's what God has called you to do. To go and reveal Jesus to your wife. And you are, you are reading it. You are seeing it. And, and I'm like, see, do you read your Bible? He said, yes. I said, please stop reading it. You are wasting your time. Why are you reading what you want to obey? Why are you hearing what you want to obey? How long are you going to, how long are you going to live in this life of disobedience? Don't you get it that pride is disobedience to God? It is pride that makes a man not to tremble at the word of God. Oh, this generation, you have not seen people tremble at the word of God. Hey. <laughs> I've been in meetings where people could not stop crying after the message. As in, they did everything. Praise the Lord. Praise nobody could stop. People couldn't stop crying. Why? The conviction of the world came upon people's soul. That is what we need to have revival. It's not somebody coming to tell you. Uh, you have a sister in Pretoria. Yes, yes. And you are planning to go to Cape Town. I see, I see. You know all those nonsense. That's not what brings revival. Until the souls of men are convicted by the word of God, there can never be personal or corporate revival. He says, submit yourself to God. You as human beings, you are saying, no, I can't submit to God. God is saying, submit to me. You are saying, no, God, I cannot submit to you. Do you know that's what you are saying? When God is showing you 
his word and say, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to live. And you say, no, I cannot do that. What you are saying is that God, go and do whatever you like. Me, I'm not going to submit to you. That is exactly what you are doing. You know, because today, people are just hearing. Some are not hearing, no. But among those who are hearing, I realize that people are just hearing, but they are not doers of the word. You know, some people just admire the word of God. They do not obey the word of God. They admire it. They just love flattery. A woman messaged me yesterday. She said, great man of God. I'm like, and I'm not trying to be humble. It is a reality that I am not great. It is a reality. I'm not a great man of God. Only Jesus is great. Why is it that the only thing you know how to do is just flatter? You know, people just, uh, people just admire the word of God and the preacher. You think anybody is interested in name? So I had to say to her, see, I'm not great. Please just call me by my first name. If you like, you can call me brother Shegun. I, I have no title and I'm not going to have any and I'm not interested in any. And all this appellage, man of our time, the Greek man, the man of his, where did you see all of those nonsense? And when you have done all of that, your life will not produce fruit of obedience. So you think that by flattering me, you think that you have helped me. There are two things that worry me about ministry. Two things. And money is, is, is not even close to any of those things. The number one thing is me not living what I'm preaching. The number two thing is people not living what they are hearing. That's what that concerns me. What is my business with a great man of God? Hey, brethren, let's welcome this, you know, why do we love these useless flatteries that takes us nowhere? And that's why we are doing movies, presenting fathers in the faith as if they are saviors, as if they are people to be worshipped. He says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do you know why devil, do you know why you can't resist the devil? How would you resist the devil when you are not submissive to God? Why should the devil obey you when you do not obey God? Did he not say we avenge every disobedience when your own obedience is complete? This is how Christians allow the devil in their lives. Allow their lives to be tormented by Satan. And then you'll be running here and there looking for solution. When the solution is you to repent and tremble at the word of God. I'm telling you, if you don't submit yourself to God, you cannot resist the devil. You won't even know how to resist the devil. He says, and he will flee from you. It's not he may flee from you. He will flee from you. So devil is not the problem. Can you see now? He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So Satan is not the problem. Do you know what the problem is? You made yourself an enemy of God. Worldliness is the problem. The pride in your heart is the problem. Satan is not the problem. You see that you are the problem. The devil is easy to deal with the devil. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Jesus resisted the devil. Jesus just quoted three verses of scriptures. And the devil flee from him. 
He didn't speak in tongues. He didn't have to shout. He just showed the devil that, see, I have understanding of the word of God. Period. That was what the woman in the garden failed to do. The woman should have stood on the word of God and said, no, this is what the word of God says. Get behind me, Satan. She didn't do that. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil is no problem. He will run away. But can you resist God? Can you resist God? You think Satan is the problem. I'm telling you Satan is not our problem. I'm telling you. Did you know that as we are speaking, as I'm speaking now, Iran is bombing Israel as, as I'm speaking now. Did you know that Israel would defend itself and will retaliate? Did you know America would defend Israel? For now, the church will not make that a prayer point today at our meetings. Guess what we will still be praying for? Breakthrough. Until, until world war comes on us and none of us can live in our houses again. And we are, we become refugee and we are moving from camp to camp. That's when we will now begin to sing the song of God. That's when we will suddenly become born again. When the situation was still in a state where we could stand in the place of prayer and resist the devil, it is money we are looking for. That is the pain of Christianity today. We see danger from afar. It doesn't matter to us. All that matters is money. We do not know how to resist the devil until the problem finally hits us. Until they begin to kill us and we are running and that our comfortable house is now being occupied by terrorists. Don't think what I'm saying is is not possible. It has happened. I'm not even telling you something that will happen. I'm telling you something that has happened. Just one day, terrorists came to Iraq, occupy about 40 to 50 percent of that land. And if you know how big that country is, and they sacked Christianity from those territories to zero. Zero. The houses that they built became houses for strangers. True life story. Right in our lifetime here. No, many pastors will never say that. Many pastors will never raise church members to say, let's pray about this. At least there are Christians in Iraq under these people. Let's pray for them. No. They destroyed every church building and Christianity was zero. There was no single Christian in that land. They are just trying to return back. The ones they caught, they, they, they beheaded them. They didn't even kill them the way they killed other people. Christians, they behead them. Some of them, they showed the video. The only reason they were beheading them was that they were Christians. They lined them up like this and cut their head. We are sitting down until such things come to us before we will wake up. Because we have been so blinded by money. That we do not know how to resist the devil. We've constituted ourselves into the enemy of God. Let me tell you again. Satan is never the problem. Satan is not the problem. If you, you see Revelation 20.10. I can't forget that scripture. That, that scripture shows us. How powerless Satan is. Revelation 20.10. Let me read it. Let me read it. <laughs> Revelation 
no before that let me read let me read revelation 20 verse 1 to 3 it says, and I saw, look at it, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he lay hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Only one angel. Just one angel. Just stood the devil like a criminal and chained him, verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Shut up. And set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a season. It wasn't a problem. And if you now go to 2010, Revelation 20.10, that's what shows us the end of Satan. It says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's the end of Satan. Revelation 20.10. The devil is not the problem. Do you know even the devil himself was cast into the lake of fire? Did you know the devil can't cast anybody into the lake of fire? Let me show you how people will go into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 15. No, let me even read verse 14 and 15. Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15. It says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Even death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. <laughs> verse 15 and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire so look at the people that goes into the lake of fire we have the devil we have the antichrist we have the false prophet we have hell and death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire the devil could not cast anybody into the lake of fire it is only god that has that power the person you should fear is God. But many of you, you fear devil. You fear the devil, you don't fear God. Because if you fear God, you will obey his word. But you fear the devil. He says, verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Do you see that? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. How do we draw near to God? Let's, let me show you how we draw near to God. You know, sometimes when I read these scriptures, I was like, ah, bro, James, why didn't you stop to explain some of these things? <laughs> how do you draw near to God? Let me show you one instance. Um, Matthew chapter 14, verse um let me see verse 23 verse 23 matthew 14 23 says jesus answered and said unto him if a man love me he will keep my words and my father will love him and we come unto him and make our abode with him look at it if a man will love, if a man love me, how will you know that man will be obedient to my words? If I say love that terrible woman, that man will love her. Anybody that genuinely loves Jesus obeys Jesus. I don't care how much you are preaching. If you are not obedient to the words of Christ, you don't love him. He says, and my father will love him. This is not a general love. This is not for God so loved the world. Let me tell you, there are some special love in the heart of God. It's not for everybody. God does not love everybody the same way. <laughs> he loves everybody in a general way. But God does not love any, everybody the same way. There is a love that that love 
it takes a man to bring that love out of God. So don't think that uh, where God loves all of us. Yes, he loves all of us. He doesn't want us to perish. And he sent his only begotten son. But there are things that he won't do for you until you believe in that his son. Until you repent and come to his son. And until you continue in his word. He said that my father will love him. Ah, God. And will come unto him. We come unto him. That means what draws God to a man is obedience to God. So when he said draw near to God, then he will draw near to you. How do you draw near to him? Obedience. And he will draw near to you. You are as close to God as you want to be. There is no partiality with God. You are as close to God as you want to be. He says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Did you see? Did you see? He, he, somebody writing to uh, God's children. And he's saying, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your heart, ye double-minded. Cleanse your hand. Those of you that have become disobedient to the word of God. Disobedient to the word of God. He says, cleanse your hand, ye sinners. Purify your heart, ye double-minded. You, you are the, you mind the world. You want to mind the kingdom also. You are here. You are there. So where exactly are you? This I want to say very strongly. Hearing the word of God and not doing it is a waste of life. If God has been speaking to you on a matter consistently and you won't change, you will perish suddenly. Proverbs 29 verse 1. I will read it to you. Because I perceive that some of you may be here. So we must be honest with ourselves. You just enjoy hearing the word of God. It's, it's like a decoration. The word of God is like a decoration. You just admire it. Proverbs 29 verse 1. He that being often reproved, hardened his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. You can pick your Bible and read it. Proverbs 29.1 Often being reproved. Often. Constantly. God kept sending his word. God kept telling you this thing you are doing is wrong. Is sinful. This thing you are doing is disobedience. Stop. Change. Obey my word. This is what I ask you to do. This is what you are doing. But yet, you are bent, no matter, no matter how much you've had that word, you are bent in your heart that I will never yield, I will keep being who I am. Can I also tell you, you will perish suddenly. You will be destroyed suddenly. The Bible says Satan has come to steal, to kill and destroy. That means that the end goal of Satan will be fulfilled in your life. And he says, and without remedy, nobody will be able to help you. Nobody will be able to save you. There will be no solution to your problem. You will perish suddenly. You are being rebuked often. You keep hearing it often. You keep, you keep going to do it. God keep telling you this is a sin. You even post, you even post it that you know this is a sin. But you still go and do it. You are not deceiving anybody. It's as if you are being reproved often. But you harden your neck. You refuse to yield. He said then you, will, you shall be destroyed. You, shall, you see the word suddenly. It won't give you time to blink. It won't give you time to repent. You will be destroyed suddenly and without remedy. 
Mountain will not save you. Any morning prayer will not save you. Man of God laying hands on you will not save you. There will be no remedy because God has reproved you often. Cleanse your hand, ye sinners. Purify your heart, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. This should be your condition today. Let your laughter be turned to money. What are you laughing about? You made yourself an opponent of God and you are happy. What, what, is, what is happiness about? You are watching movie and you are smiling. You are smiling. You are happy. Yet you are, you've made yourself an enemy of God. When you should be mourning, when you should be crying, when you should be rolling on the floor and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Don't let me perish, Father. You are about to perish, but you are laughing. You are watching comedy. You are laughing. He said, and your joy to heaviness. Your heart should be heavy. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of God. He came back to the same thing again. So what is humility? Obedience to the word of God. Humility is not you sitting down like this. That's not humility. Have you not seen? <laughs> you know, a woman told me, she said, sir, nobody can believe the wickedness of my husband. She said, my husband is so gentle, so easy going, so easy looking, but he is evil. I understand what she was saying. Humility is not in appearance. In fact, in reality, only God can tell who is humble. Somebody you think is humble may even not be humble. No, every beggar is humble. <laughs> they are not humble in circumstance. When their circumstance improves, we will know who is humble. But anybody that is not submissive to the word of God is not an humble person. It doesn't matter how quiet you are. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humility that is not for show. Humility that is not for men. Humility that is before God. He says, and he shall lift you up. You see, you can't humble yourself and God will leave you. You know, initially he says that he gives grace to the humble. Can you see another thing he gives to the hum humble? Upliftment. He said of you, pray, you are praying for next level. Lord, Lord, lift me up, lift me up. No, stop praying for God to lift you up. Go and humble yourself and he shall lift you. Just go and humble yourself. Stop praying for breakthrough. Stop praying for next level. What is the... What is the next level? You know, sometimes you are even praying prayer, you don't know what you are praying. Say, Lord, Lord, lead, you know, when a preacher says the theme for his conference is next level, please, what is next level? What, ex what exactly is next level? Do you know they don't know? If you ask them, they don't know it. <laughs> they don't know exactly what that next level is. People say many things that they don't understand. If you see them, they ask them, so what do you mean by this? They actually don't know. <laughs> and they're only saying it. He says, and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. Brethren, God will lift you up. You see, it is God that lifts a humble man. 
he will lift you up. It's not men. The uplifting has nothing to do with men. You remain humble and you will experience the upliftment of God. His word can never fail. If he says he will lift the humble, I'm telling you he will lift you up. And can I say something to you? If God lifts you up, you can't follow. If God carries you, you can't fall. If men carries you, their hand will pain them. They will drop you. Do you know that even a mother, no matter how loving a mother is, that carries a child. I had once carried my sister's child to the point where I had terrible cramps and I could not walk for minutes after they took the child away from me. If it continues, a time will come, I'll drop the child. <laughs> you know, that was the time I had to join a group to carry a coffin. You know, coffin, usually six people will carry a coffin. Two in the front, two in the middle, two at the back. I was in the front, <laughs> carrying the coffin on the shoulder. So six of us. So when we were to carry the coffin to the church building, that church, the distance from the door to the pulpit, where we would place the body, the coffin, the aisle was so long. And I was much younger than this. <laughs> By then we got to half or halfway. I said to myself, this is where this dead body is going to come out of this coffin because me, I'm dropping this coffin. <laughs> I was feeling so much pain. I was at the verge of dropping the coffin. I just managed. Managed. Somehow, I almost dropped it. Just because once I drop it, it will affect every, every other person. See, that's human being. There's an extent to which a human being can carry you. But God will lift you. You may look down, but God will lift you. You may look helpless, but God will lift you. You may have reached a place where they tell you, in this society, nobody goes beyond this. I'm telling you, God will take you beyond it. Oh, what a pleasant thing when God lifts a man up. How wonderful it is when God lifts a man. Even Jesus. When God lifted Jesus up, <laughs> he had to come and sit at the right hand of the Father. God lifted him up. Force of gravity could not pull Jesus down, for God took him. When God lifts you, there's nothing men can do about it. But he only lifts the humble. Eh? God carries the humble. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Speak not evil one of another. He that speak evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. You know why he's writing like this? Always go back to verse 1. See the people he wrote to. So the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. He was writing to Christian Jews that understood the law. So you see, their own writing, the writing of James is different from Paul slightly in the sense that Paul was basically writing to the Gentile who had believed in Jesus. The apostles were writing mostly to Jews who had believed in Jesus. So they were writing to people who are familiar with the law. It's like if I want to preach to um, a Muslim convert or atheist convert. You know, see, they are both different. A Muslim has an idea of God, has an idea of obedience to the word of God. An atheist does not even know anything like that. <laughs> so there are two different people. So how, how you approach the two people may be different. But the bottom line is this. 
He says, we must not speak evil of one another. He said, there is one Lord giver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are thou that judges another? Now look at the Lord giver. He's able to save and he's also able to destroy. Uh, some people say, no, God does not destroy. <laughs> I don't know what Bible they are reading. You know, people think that God is nice. God is not nice. God is good. Nice is tolerating people. God does not tolerate people. <laughs> God helps people. God shows people the right thing to do. God rebukes people. God corrects people. Nice people don't do anything. Their children that is smoking, they don't mind. Hey, John, you know he's smoking? Yeah, dad. All right. So John says, my daddy is such a nice daddy. <laughs> you know, a, a correct father, a true father, is a father that can balance care and discipline. Some parents are seeking the love of their children. So they can't discipline their children because they want their children to love them. So if the mother disciplines the child, the father will now come to the child as if he's the loving one. That don't mind your mom. So the children will begin to tend to be on the side of the father and not on the side of the mother. That's foolishness. Adults seeking the love of their children. When they should have been united in disciplining those children. So he's able to save, he's able to destroy. Now let's round up. Let's begin to round up. He said, go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on tomorrow, for what is life. Now, guess what he's saying here now? That how come you have confidence to plan your life? To be so accurate that you will say that, this is what I will do tomorrow. This is what I will do next tomorrow. You know, this is where people began to say, oh, by the grace of God. But it's not just saying by the grace of God. There's something I want us to pay attention to. It says, for what is your life? It's even a vapor. Look at life. Say life is a vapor. <laughs> I boiled water this morning. The water was boiling. There was vapor. But do you know that I can't locate that vapor again? Just less than one hour, 15 minutes ago. I can't locate the vapor. It's gone forever. I can never find it. He said, that's how life is. A vapor that you see now. It's even a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanishes away. Next time you want to think about life, think of a vapor. That's how life is. I heard of a man who lost his sister and also lost his brother within a short space of time. Did you know that there was a time when the father was alive, the mother, and then they gave birth to two children. Let's say they were six or four or five. Before you know it, if God arranged it according to their age, the father will go, the mother will go. You know there are families like that. First born will be gone, second born will be gone, third born will be gone, and finally the last will be gone. And that entire family that they used to be in the same house, all of them used to play, all of them, do you know it's gone? It's only memory you have now. That's why like, this today now will once again become a memory. There was a memory of your childhood when you were playing and so on. You know, before you know it, everybody, you know, everybody is going gradually. All the, you are celebrating 40, 50, 60. People don't know that they are waving goodbye. A whole generation is going. Before you know it, people like us now, we will become grandfather if it pleases God. And they will be calling me, and my my grandchildren will now be saying, "Don't mind, Grandpa. I, I'm now Grandpa." -o. <laughs> and before you know it, I'm gone also. So 
20 years down the line, nobody may remember me again. Just gone like that. He says, that is why. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will. It's not just you to say it. You must recognize that if the Lord doesn't will it, it will not come to pass. Look at what he says. If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. Do you recognize that if the Lord wills? Because many times you are just saying by the grace of God. But you are in your heart. You settled it in your heart that that is what you are doing. Nothing can change it. <laughs> but he says if the Lord wills. Do you know it is if the Lord wills? We have a meeting on Monday. Teaching of Christ series. If the Lord wills, we will meet on Monday. 9 p.m. Nigerian time. 9 p.m. UK time. <laughs> if the Lord will. It's not just saying it with mouth. It is a state of heart that recognizes that if the Lord does not will this from the heart, if it does not come rather from the heart of God, there's nothing I can do. This thing that I'm planning to do, if it is not of the will of God, I will not succeed. So he said, but now, you rejoice in your boasting. All such boasting is evil. All the boasting of, uh, you know, I was um, indoor yesterday. Was it yesterday or two days ago? And I had some people having notifications between them. And one was saying, I will deal with you. By the time I finish dealing with you, by the time I show you, by the time, in fact, what I will do to you, what I will, you know, where I was quietly, I was like, look at this people. Look at their foolishness. You are, you are boasting how you will deal with somebody. You that you don't know that your breath is gone. Your breath is, is just maybe a few hours away. I saw a video where a woman was dancing. Hey, with a lot of kids, everybody, they were dancing. And the camera stayed on her, strangely. And then suddenly she stopped. And then she slumped. By the time they carried her, she was dead. So when she was dancing, dancing, she didn't know that she had just two minutes more to live. That's why it says we should not boast. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. To him that knoweth to do good and do not do it, to that person it is a sin. That means that, see, there are some things may not be a sin to another person, but it may be a sin to you. That's why don't judge your life by other people. You know that this thing is, ah, this thing is a sin, but you go ahead and do it. This other person does not see it that way. You know, you know how to do good. You know, you know. You know, you know that this is the good you should do. Some people don't know it. <laughs> do you know giving is grace? Giving is not, um, is not based on how much somebody has. If you have a, if you have somebody in your family who gives, go and check. That person has been giving even when that person had nothing. It's grace. So don't boast about it. <laughs> it's the gift of God. Is the gift of God. He said, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and do it not, it is a sin. So let me say to you that at their good you know how to do, you refuse to do it. You are living in sin. You know that God says that this is how I should treat my wife. But you refuse to do it. You know you should talk to your wife. You know the Bible says, live joyfully with the wife of your youth. But you live miserably with that woman. You are living in sin. You are a sinner. Every good you know how to do, you are not doing it. It's a sin unto you. It's not my opinion. It's what the scripture says. May God give you grace. May the Lord give you understanding in the mighty name of Jesus. God has spoken to us this way because God wants our life to be closer 
drawn to him. It is my prayer that today, when you hear his voice, you will not again harden your heart. You will respond to the Lord. Let us pray. There are many things the Lord has said to us in this passage. He has spoken to us in diverse ways. And I want to believe that he has spoken to you in a very specific way. Take that matter to God in prayer. In that area that he has spoken to you, speak with him. But I want to emphasize for those of you, I know there are some of you, God is warning you that your refusing to obey him, even when you know the truth, will lead you to sudden destruction. You have made yourself an enemy of God. You have made yourself an opponent of God. God does not want to oppose you. God does not want to resist you. God wants to save you. God wants to show you mercy. Today, why not tremble at his word? Why not cry and say, Lord, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. I've been disobedient to you. Like that brother who kept reading everything God said about marriage in scripture and still chooses to be wicked to his wife. What he doesn't realize is that he's playing with sudden destruction. So what is the difference between you and a non-believer if you also will perish without remedy? Please address that matter today. He says, be afflicted and mourn. Cleanse your hand, you sinners. The blood of Jesus is available to cleanse you. He said, purify your heart, you double-minded. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. That wickedness in your heart that makes you to be continuously rebellious to God. He says, purify it today. And Jesus is on the standby to, to cleanse, to purify. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I will come in unto him. He is knocking your heart today. Jesus is knocking the door of your heart today. He wants to come in. He says, be afflicted and mourn. Weep. Eh? Weep, 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 weep. Weep for your sin. Weep for your continuous sustained disobedience. He says, weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. That's a man that is repenting. That's a man that trembles at the word of God. May you not leave this place today and then go back again and continue in rebellion and disobedience. For you have been warned of the word of the Lord. The word of God has warned you. Your life is like a vapor. I hope you will not vaporize suddenly. Make your life right with God. Draw near to him by repentance. Say, Lord, give me the grace to go and obey you. I don't want to continue in my wickedness again. Have mercy on me, O oh Lord. Have mercy on my life. Brethren, be encouraged. He says he gives grace to the humble. He lifts the humble. You see, that is the part I would have loved us to focus on. But I know that if you have not settled that matter of being proud, there cannot be grace for humility. But you see, he gives grace to the humble. He lifts up. Please be encouraged that God lifts up. Thank him for the upliftment. Thank him for the grace that you don't know that is coming to your life. Just because you have humbled yourself before him. It is automatic grace. It is released consistently to your life. You may not know why certain things are working for you, but it is the grace of God. 
The grace of God is very silent. It's very quiet. So you may not even see it. You may not even know that it's God's grace that is at work. Give him all the glory. Give him all the honor. Give him all the praise. Thank him for his goodness. Thank him for the way he has spoken to us again. Please, if you are not able to settle the matter now, go to your closet and cry to God. Cry and ask God to help you. May you not perish suddenly. May you not perish without remedy. May you not be destroyed in the name of Jesus. May your heart that has become stony become flesh. May you receive a new heart from Jesus today. A heart of obedience in the name of Jesus. Let's round up our prayers. Give him all the thanks. Give him all the praise. Thank him for his mercy. I tell you again, brethren, it is the mercy of God. Thank him for his mercy. Thank you, Father. We are grateful to you for your mercy. You know how weak we are. But Lord, you have shown not against strength from your throne. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We worship and we adore you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.